1, chapter 3, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So, the Apostle Paul in chapter 2 has been giving us a lot of logic. He's been kind of coming in lovingly debating, but actually putting to shame these false gospels, these false teachers that have come in. And it's really important to understand there is logic, there is theology behind the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We know he was a real man who existed. We know how his disciples died, not just in Scripture, but outside of Scripture as well. In context, we know that he could not have risen from the grave except by supernatural powers because the elite guard of the Romans were standing there with the imperial seal on the door with their lives hanging on the line. The only way he could come out of there was through supernatural powers. So, but as important as it is to understand logic in our minds, we have to be able to apply it and actually act on it. So it doesn't do us any good if it's just head knowledge. And this is where Paul's coming to is we need to act on the truth. And I was thinking about this. My kids are at the age where my four-year-old is still at the point where he knows that the road is dangerous. But if you allow a ball to roll into the street, he will chase it no matter what you've said. Why? Because it's head knowledge to him. He's never seen the repercussions of the street. He's never seen what it can do. Now, my nine-year-old has been exposed to wrecks. He's seen stuff happen or people get hurt. He has a realization. But still, that four-year-old doesn't realize that when the ball rolls out, there's danger in that street. And when I put this in the context, I think of Jesus, what he did for us on the cross. It would be as if I was saying to my son, Silas, hey, look, I've told you enough. I've told you for your whole life. The road is dangerous, but don't go near it. Don't go anywhere near it. It will cost you your life. And it's just not getting through. Every day I have to chase him down and keep him from going in after the ball. Well, one day... I decide I want to give my son a visual because I know the moment that I'm not there, he will run to that road and he will get killed. So when we think about Jesus on the cross, it would be like me running out in front of my son and allowing a car just to wipe me out on the street. I've given my life, what? As an example to show him what the street is really all about. And now it's moved from just a head knowledge. I know about the street. No, I have visually seen what running into the road at the ball will do. And when we think about Jesus, who was our example, that's what he did on the cross. He's saying, stay away from sin. It's not worth it. It leads to death. And we wouldn't listen for thousands of years. And so what he had to do was let me show you what the end result of this looks like. And he moved it from a head knowledge to the heart. And the Holy Spirit's going to start speaking through the, through the Apostle Paul here in chapter 3. And he's going to tell us we need to start living out our walk like Jesus did. We need to view the gospel like Jesus did. And there's this beautiful story in John chapter 8. Um, if, if most of you know it, if you don't, I'm going to recap it just a little bit. I'm not going to read it because there's too many verses. But basically, Jesus is ministering in town. And he is sitting, just talking with his guys. And then all of a sudden, the high religious people, the Pharisees and these guys, they they find a woman who is caught in the act of adultery. And while Jesus is sitting there, they bring her to him. And they throw her at his feet and say, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law says she should die. There is no way out for her. What do you say, teacher? And I just remember, he was just sitting there and he's just drawing with his fingers in the sand. And he says something beautiful. He looks at the guys holding the rocks who are ready to stone her and kill her and says, if you were without sin, you cast the first stone. And then one by one, they dropped the rocks and they walked away. And he looks at the woman, I don't know what shape she was in. She's probably crying and she knew she was caught dead to rights and was worthy of death. She knew her life was on the line. And he said, look up. Where are your accusers? And she said, there's, there's none left. And he says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And there's this beautiful, it shows us a beautiful picture of the power of Jesus' forgiveness. Caught in the very act. There's no time lapse in it. She's caught in sin in that moment. And Jesus said, I have the power to forgive you. Go and sin no more. 
it's been wiped away. But there's something practical here about the gospel that I think we lose sight of. And as I'm putting myself in Jesus' shoes in that scene, and there's lots of debates of what he's writing on the ground and those things, I don't, I don't get into all that, but there's something that visually struck me. How Jesus viewed the gospel, the first way that he viewed it was he was on ground level. And what I mean by that is the work portion of the gospel. He viewed it as, I'm right here, there's work to be done. And he's stooping down, and as they throw her at his feet, he's just running his fingers through the dirt. And I was thinking about the creator of the universe as those sands are just going through his fingers. Is he remembering the work in the creation of Adam at that moment. That I formed every single person standing here perfectly. They were fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm says. And he's just letting those sands just go through his fingers. Is that what he's remembering when this woman is being accused of adultery? And I was just thinking, do we see ourselves on ground level when the scripture says we don't war against flesh and blood. It's not the people in front of us, but it's spiritual things that we go up against. But do we see these people that are standing there practically as people that God fearfully and wonderfully made and Jesus died for every single one of those? And I always teach, do we understand that if we were the only person alive in this world, Jesus would have still come for you as an individual and paid the price on the cross. That's how valuable every single person is to Christ. I want you to see that example that sin is death and I don't want you to go through that. But what do we do when the world's depravity is thrown at our feet in the middle of ministry, in the middle of our house, all these things. And if you've been there, if you've lived for longer than three days, you know what I'm talking about. The darkness surrounds us at all time. But what do we do when it's thrown in our face like this woman was thrown at the feet of Jesus? Well, not only did he view the gospel on the ground level, the work to be done. But in that scripture, when he went to confront her accusers, he was stooping down, running his fingers through the dirt. But it says something beautiful. He stood up. He rose above that. So Jesus not only viewed the gospel as the groundwork level, but he also he saw the gospel from above. He saw it from a different perspective. And it was all about God's redemptive plan. It had nothing to do with anything else. He had to step back. Wait a minute, these guys are right. The law says to crush her where she is. But I can't judge that way. I've got to step back. God has a bigger plan on this. It's for redemption. So he's looking at the situation through God's redemptive plan. And I was thinking about in ministry, there are many times when um, you, think, you think you're above making mistakes when you're actually ministering to somebody, but you're actually more inclined. Why? Because it's that pivotal moment in somebody's life who needs ministry that your flesh will take advantage of it. And what I mean by that is what happens is we lose focus of that big picture that God is sovereign, that he's in control of everything like we learned in the last couple chapters, that he has everything in control. An example of this would be uh, when we're dealing with people in crisis, that's one of my jobs is uh, we have to deal with people with financial crisis, home crisis, if they're coming in through drugs, rehab, whatever it might look like. But everybody always gets confused when they're overly excited about the situation. They're like, you know what, if you don't do something now, it's not, my life is over. In the first little while, I didn't react this way, but it took a much wiser man who taught me through the scripture. He said, don't let their problems become yours. Because if you do, then you will join them in the sin that they're creating or acting because you're stepping outside God's will. You're stepping outside of trusting God, and now you're sitting like they are. They're not trusting God. They're, you're saying, look, this is too big for God. i got to react. He said, stop, pray, and figure out what God wants to do. And a lot of times... I've learned something really odd, and it shouldn't be odd, but it's odd to me, that if I stop trying to help and I pray about it, it's usually fixed by the time, like, I've got an answer for them. I go back and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. Like, oh, you know what? Something came in and it got provided for. I don't need any help now. It was just, and I'm sitting there going, why is this odd to me? It's because I'm looking at the gospel at ground level only, and I'm not remembering to look from above the way God has us in his hands He's got us perfectly. And later in chapter 3, as we get into the study more, we're going to learn about working ground level, what it looks like. But Paul, in his first opening four verses, what he does, is he takes us up at 35,000 feet and says, hey, let me show you what the gospel looks like from up here. 
And it's all about Jesus. And that he's in control and everything is about him. He opens up with the first verse by saying, If then you have been raised with Christ. It's a huge statement. We, we read this first when this first topic in Colossians came up. It says we have been raised when, in chapter 2 when he's talking about baptism. That we're symbolically reminding ourselves through baptism that we have been raised with Christ. He's not asking a question. Remember, he's summing up. He's a great lawyer. He talks about chapter 1 and 2. He said, okay, so the fact is we're raised. What do we do with that truth now? And there's some benefits. He's reminding us, as I was reading this and looking back, there's benefits to being raised from Christ, with Christ from the dead. And it's all around our relationship. Romans 5, Romans 5 1 says, we are justified. What does that mean? It means that as we were saved, the penalty of sin, just like the girl caught in adultery, was removed instantly. And I love, there's a, there's a teacher that taught us this. And he says, remember the word justified. Chop it in three. Just if I'd never sinned, never failed, never had a weakness. God took Jesus and he replaced all of those things. That was his gift for us. Romans 6.19 says not only are we justified, but we're sanctified. That means we've been pulled out of the world and set apart for his use perfectly. And I love the process of sanctification. Not that we'll ever go back into the world because of him, because he set us apart, but he wants to make us more mature and more like him. We are being constantly made into his image. And then if you remember our Philippian study, it says in Philippians 3.21, one day we will be glorified. Not that we get the praise, but we will end up having a body just like Jesus'. It will be totally sin-free. These are the three benefits that when Jesus raised from the dead and we were raised with him in salvation, that we get to reap because he raised us. And I was thinking about this, this part of death because we don't like to think of it, but it's huge in Scripture. The book of Revelation talks about Jesus and it describes him this way uh, in Revelation 1.5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Go back to that street. He's our, he is the firstborn of the dead. He's our example. And we have to look at what Jesus did. If, he, if we're raised with him, then we have the same purpose that he did. We have the same calling to still continue to minister the gospel as Jesus did. And I was thinking about this. What are the things that he did after his resurrection? Well, to me, the first thing that was most important in this is he left the tomb. Imagine that. If he'd have stayed in the tomb, he's alive, he's just hanging out. You know what? I'm alive now, but I'm going to hang out where I am. No, he had to leave the tomb, and so should we. Do you remember what he called the Pharisees? He said, look, guys, you are nothing but a bunch of whitewashed tombs. You look really pretty on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones. You're dead inside. They were dead in their pride. They were dead in their self-righteousness. They were dead in their self-ambition. This is what they were staying in. And he's called us to leave this tomb that we were dead in of self. He's saying, look, leave that. I've raised you. You have a purpose. Go outside of that. It says in verse 3, it says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Dwayne's terms, look guys, we need to have a funeral. Our old man is dead. Leave him in the tomb. It's time for the new creation to walk outside those four walls of self and leave it behind. And I like what Jesus is, Jesus used to, he called the Holy Spirit the comforter. And this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, think about where this church is in Colossae. Put yourself in their shoes. They have been under the torment and spiritual attack of these false teachers. And what has happened? They have lost their security in who? Jesus. Well, maybe I need to go buy a few more ambulances to protect me. Maybe I need to do a few different chants like these druids so I can make sure I'm really spiritual. All these things because it was drawing them away from the attention of who Jesus was. They had been robbed of that security. And Romans 8, 38 and 39 clearly says, Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God in who? Christ Jesus. Beautiful verse. We have security in Him and salvation. It's time to leave the tomb of these false teachers and false gospels that are out there. We have to leave those behind. So he left the tomb. The second thing that I read as Jesus was resurrected, he spent his remaining time on earth. He didn't take a vacation. He didn't chill out. He spent the remaining time ministering to his disciples. 
He was comforting, doubting Thomas. Remember the guy? He said, you know what? I'm not going to believe him until I touch his nail scars or I put my hands in the rib where the spear went. I won't believe it's him or he raised. He went to him and comforted him and said, look, here I am. On the road to Emmaus, the two disciples who were confused and just kind of wandering off. Well, let's go down here and see what's going on. He walks beside them the seven miles to Emmaus and tells them. And finally, at the end, he reveals himself to him just to comfort them and say, look, what you went through these past few years, what you gave up was not in vain. I'm still here. And then he witnessed to so many more. So the second thing, he spent time with his, with his people. And so we have to be able to pull ourselves outside the tomb of self and say, I'm going to spend time with others. I'm not going to isolate myself. And I'm going to serve others because that's what Jesus has called me to do. Leave that tomb of isolation. And I was thinking about the family shelter that we went to uh, on New Year's. And I know it's hard because New Year's is a, is, a, is a holiday and those things. And I'm not, it was hard for me. Let me, I'm going to point my fingers at myself. It was hard for me to get out of bed and want to go do this. And when I got there, I just know that God is faithful to show up even when I'm not feeling it. But as soon as we started making the meals and we started realizing that the staff was understaffed, and like I said, God, God prepared that perfectly. So don't, don't have any condemnation over this. He did it perfectly. He gave us the right amount of people in the right time. So he is faithful to continue that. But what he did, though, was he showed up when I wasn't ready to minister. And as soon as the gospel started going out, and it wasn't just in words, it was in deed. It was just loving on these ladies, these kids. And uh, all the strength that I was lacking in that moment, man, I was just picked up in that strength. And God said... I'm here. You're doing my work. You're going to have the strength to do it. And then, you know, we had more than enough hands. We had more than enough people that were capable of doing it. And it just went beautifully. And great, a couple, wasn't as many relationships as we normally did, but the ones that we made, those ladies felt loved when we were done. They were cherished. Why? Because we left the tomb of isolation. We need to be around others. And there's more opportunities coming up. Don't worry about that. But we have to step outside that. The third thing after his resurrection, and I love this one because we either go too far with it or we don't talk about it at all. But Jesus was walking in supernatural power after the resurrection. And he's calling us to do it. Verse 1 says, the last part of verse 1 says, Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is important to understand because Jesus walked around doing miracles and doing, making the impossible possible after the resurrection. He was doing it before, but he was doing it even more. More people were being reached at this point. They were like, my life is being changed. Like we read in the book of Acts. When they heard that Jesus had resurrected, what were they doing? Like, we're all in, guys. We're going to sell all the stuff we got. We're going to be into this. We're going to commune together. I got your back. You got my back. Hold us accountable. Help us keep each other uplifted. We're invested in the kingdom work. But how did he do, how, do, how does he do this? How does he not take a vacation for these days. He just had the cross. He just gave everything. Well, his heart, the root desire of Jesus was to do what? He said it right from the beginning. I'm here to glorify my Father. I want to please Him. And I know, even though I just gave everything on the cross, I took the death blow from God Himself. Every ounce of strength was robbed for me. But if I know I step out and I'm doing His will, the strength will be there. So we need to remember, if we have that close relationship, who's here with us? We know Jesus spent 33 years down here, but for the last 2,000, we've had the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit himself has been living here every day with us, longing for every moment, saying, let me in, let me, let me work. Just give me the opportunity to use you. I want to use you more than you want to be used by me. He's sitting there on our shoulders. And then Jesus, at the end of his life, promised this crazy thing. He said, we would do greater things than he did. Why? Because he's going where? To the Father. What did this verse just say? He is seated at the right hand of God. He's there right now. That benefit of the Holy Spirit is here for not only for the Church of Colossae, but in 2016, it's here for the Church of Gathering Stones. Any Christian who will step into that office of the gospel and start living it, the Holy Spirit is there. He provides the power for ministry. 
And I was thinking about the same Jesus who healed the sick. I love how the song cast out demons. That is cool stuff. Think about it. That is cool. I love that. And he says, these things we will do. But as I walk with the Lord a little bit longer, there's a greater miracle that happens to believers every single day that I think we take for granted. We just, we just don't even count it as a miracle anymore. So you guys remember Doubting Thomas? I mentioned him a minute ago. So he's sitting there and he's saying, Look, I want to believe you guys, this report that Jesus, that you saw him, but I'm not going to believe you until he comes here in front of me and I put my fingers in the nail holes. Well, Jesus lovingly shows up and says, Thomas, here. And then what does Thomas do? It's you, Lord. I believe. I'm excited. Now I know. But Jesus says something to him very specific. In John 20, 29, he says, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So the greatest miracle that's happening today is when a soul comes into the kingdom of God, not through a sign, not through a wonder, but through what? The miracle of the gospel. The gospel message is a huge miracle that I I don't think we put it in that class or that category of miraculous. And I was thinking, physical miracles have their place. They're still, don't get me wrong, they are for today. But I think about men in the Bible like Nebuchadnezzar. Do you guys remember him? You all heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace? Okay, He was the king when this was going on. He decides to make this 40-foot statue of himself out of gold and says, hey, bow down, worship it. And the miracle happens that these three guys don't. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego said, nope, uh, do what you will to us, but we're not going to bow to you. We only serve one God. So he says, strike up the furnace and make it hotter than it's ever been before. And even the guards that went to the furnace melted when they threw the guys in. That's how hot it was. And he looks in there. And he sees Jesus himself. He says, I see the three guys. They're still alive. But there's a fourth now. And he looks like the Son of God. He saw Jesus himself. He had dreams that were interpreted, visions that were interpreted by Daniel. All these things. Did that change him? No, he's still messed up. And God decides, you know what? This guy is not listening. I've given him everything. I've given him every opportunity. I'm going to turn him into the the mindset of an animal and he's going to graze in the grass and his nails are going to grow out and he's going to do this for seven years and he's pretty much going to be just wandering through the wilderness eating like a cow, just naked and just humiliated because he would not bow to me. He chose not to. I gave him miracles. I think of uh, the children of Israel. They saw all the things in Israel. They saw them in Egypt going on. All those wonders. And did they pay attention in the wilderness? No, let's go back to Egypt. There's better there. So, the miracles are important, but what drove them through? What drove Nebuchadnezzar, what brought him through the other end of those seven years? It was the faithful love of God through who? Daniel. Daniel ministered to him for seven years while he was going through this. And when he came out the other end, we know in Scripture that Nebuchadnezzar woke up and said, You know what? There's only one God, and I'm not him. So, that, that miracle of ministering to somebody one-on-one, the gospel message. Don't forget it's in that miracle category. And Paul has given us the secret to success as Christians here in verse 1. He repeats himself, in, at least in, in one aspect. Verse 1, he says, Seek the things that are above. In verse 2, he kind of repeats himself. Set your minds on things that are above. So he uses that word above twice. And I went back in the Greek in this. And that word above means kind of what you think it means. It's on the top, and it means most high. Who do we call the most high? God himself. So when he's talking about this, he's saying, look, focus on the top. The person that created everything, the person that has all this in control, who's he talking about? Seek God. Set your mind on God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You can actually, if you wanted to, you could remove the word kingdom and put God's will. That's what that means. Seek God's will, what he desires for this, let, let his reign rule in us. So how do we seek him? How do we seek God? Scripture's clear. With all our heart, our, our mind, our soul, our strength, everything is his but most importantly, a heart. He wants us to love him back. Because why? He first loved us. We don't even know how to love until we've seen him. 
And I was thinking about this. Uh, when Sherry and I were, um, well, even before we were dating, before I decided, you know what? I would like to date Sherry. I'd like to seek her attention. There's things I would do. I would prepare myself. Okay, I would clean myself up. I'm not talking about physically cleaning yourself up for salvation, but I would prepare myself to go see her. Or I would find out, hey, what does she like? What movies does she like? What um, things does she like to do? Does she like to do music? Does she like to do crafts? All these things to get ready to go what? Seek her attention. I want to find out what she likes so I can seek her. And most importantly, when I was seeking her, I made time for her. Trust me, it was no problem opening my schedule to meet Sherry in those moments. I found time some way, somehow, and I gave her the most precious thing I had, my time. And that's what we do with God. We prepare ourselves. How? Through prayer, through the Word, through giving Him our time. We seek Him with all of our heart. He's the most high. He's at the top. He's the most important thing on our list when we wake up this morning. How do I seek Him today? And then how do I bring everything else into that? He also says to set our minds above. And later on in the chapter, I think it's in verse 16, he will directly tell us how, but it's through the word of God. How do you set your mind on him? How do I set my mind to what Sherry needs? I have to find out who she is and what she is so I can understand her. And that's what Paul's saying. Set your mind on him. And the only way we do that is through his word. We know him that way. He gave that to us. Romans 12, 2 says... Do not be conformed to this world. Remember that tomb that we were in? Don't be conformed to that. Don't, don't try to operate inside that. He says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That only comes to the word of God. It transforms us. My translation would be, leave the tomb. You've died. Your old self is dead. Leave your old self in the tomb. You're alive in him. Verse 3 says, we are hidden in Christ. We are to live as though we belong to him, not the tomb. No longer. As I was looking at this, I was wondering, before we get into the fourth thing of what Jesus did, how does Jesus approach the Father? If you're seeking him and you're setting your mind on him, how do you approach him? And I remember when I was dating Sherry, I'd always ask the question, well, what do you want to do? What would you like to go out and do? What would you like to eat? Can I get the door for you? Can I do this? What was I doing? I was submitting to her. So that what? I could love her. And I love what it says here. Um, in verse 1, it ends with, He is seated at the right hand of God. So that fulfilled the promise of the Holy Spirit coming. We know that. But this is important. That word right hand in the original Greek is a feminine term. And it doesn't mean Jesus is girly. It means that he is submitting to the Father. He is coming alongside of him saying, Look, I've done my work so far. I'm going to wait here until you tell me what else to do. I'm going to sit in communion with you until it's time to go back and get my people. You let me know when that time has come. But right now, I'm with you. So he's submitting to him. And I like this because think about what he did. He placed his life in God's capable, protective hands. Showing us that we can too. Why? So that we never have to fear trusting Him. Ever. And I was thinking, if we're real for a minute, when the weight of the world seems too much and it pulls us down, like this lady that was thrown at His feet, how do we get through that? And I think it's in verse 4. It says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. It boils down to really, really, really knowing that this world is not the end all and be all. It is not everything. It will all lapse one day. So that leads us to the fourth thing that Jesus did as he rose from the grave. He always looked forward to heaven. He was excited to go. Even though he had his people holding on to him, imagine how much more he must have loved heaven than even the people that he loved on earth. He loves his disciples so much. I mean, he put up with so much. Those guys, you know, he's, he's teaching them something theolo theological and giving them the great mysteries of heaven. And their answer is, hey, it's because we don't have any bread that he's mad at us. No, guys, that's not what I'm talking about. He had so much patience and kindness for them. But he was desiring. He said, look, I have to go to the Father so that I can send you the comforter. 
I love you so much, but I have to go. It has to happen this way because I'm ultimately submitting to God's will so that you can benefit from me doing that. And I was thinking he was invested in heaven. That's why he was so excited. He gave everything. And I remember in my early 20s, I was uh, awarded after, I think, two years of company service. I get to get into the 401k. That was so exciting for a young guy. And I remember... Man, I I had never looked at my company's stock ever before. But as soon as they gave me some money and said, hey, we're going to take it out of your check and then uh, we're going to put it in this 401k and what we're going to do is we're going to invest it in these different stocks and you can click whether you want it to be safe stocks or you can click if you want it to be kind of crazy and put more risk to it. And every day for two years, I sat there and looked at the stock market and said, what are we doing today? How's the stock going today? And, And, you know, it might be... 15 cents one month, I might make $15 the next, but I was excited about the 401k. Why? Because my money was going into it. I was looking toward the future of what it was going to be like. I was excited about that. And I I remember our Philippians uh, study, it was so exciting to hear Paul say in chapter 1, he gave this crazy statement, to live is Christ, but to die is what? Gain. Here's a man who gave everything for the gospel's sake. He was so invested that, look, I really love living, and I love living out the ministry. I love living out the gospel and changing people's lives and watching the Holy Spirit do that through the ministry. But man, it's nothing in comparison to heaven. It's exciting. You know, you may, you may say, you know, thinking of heaven just really doesn't get me through the day. And my question to you is, are we really investing in eternity? Are we really giving toward it? Matthew 6, 21 says, Jesus talked about, he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I remember, I cared a lot more about that 401k when my money started going in it. I was invested in it. And then eventually when the recession hit, the 401k was gone. He didn't have that option anymore. It was taken, and it was a sober reminder that things on earth don't last. They always run out. They're not eternal. And I'm challenging us to start making those account transfers into eternity, to not just be satisfied with the way that things are going, looking ahead. And I want to look back. So the way that Jesus transferred was what? He left the tomb. What does that mean for us? We can't be hung up on the world. We've got to let it go. It's, it's not going to last. It all fades. He lived to serve others. And this is important. If we start making transfers of friends and family and souls that we have discipled or led to the Lord into heaven, we not only have the added benefit of, I want to see Jesus when I get there, but I want to see my family and my friends and all those people who walked with me. I've invested in heaven. My eyes are there now because I realize as people start passing and everybody's going, That's all I've got left. That's my hope. That's what Paul said. As I'm watching people get martyred, as my baby Christians are being led away by these Romans or thrown into prison uh, with Nero lighting them up like torches. This is where I want to be. This is is all that's left. That's real gain. I want to be with them. And then walking in supernatural power, we have to start being led by the Holy Spirit now. What does it teach us? We are learning to trust in Him. When He says, go talk to this person or minister to them or, you know what, get involved in this ministry, we're learning to trust Him here and now so it's not so difficult in the future. We're learning, look, He's faithful in these little moments when we're at the mission or we're at our house talking to our kids or we're at the grocery store and somebody reaches out. He's faithful in every single moment. We can trust Him to be there with us. Start making those transactions. That way we can long for heaven like Jesus did. We'll be there with him. And I was thinking, if, those are the, if that's the way that we work on the ground level, we will work the gospel here. But like Jesus, our head will always be up here, longing for heaven, because that's our home. Our citizenship is there. That's where we belong. This is just work. I want to go home and be with my family. I want to go home and be with my Savior. That's what's most important. So today I want to start looking for ways of investing in his word, and in people's lives as a church. Let's pray.